The Moonstone, Part 43 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins Read by Graham Redman The Discovery of the Truth Fourth Narrative Continued June the twentieth. Mr. Blake is beginning to feel his continued restlessness at night. The sooner the rooms are refurnished now, the better. On our way to the house this morning, he consulted me, with some nervous impatience and irresolution, about a letter, forwarded to him from London, which he had received from Sergeant Cuff. The sergeant writes from Ireland. He acknowledges the receipt, through his housekeeper, of a card and message which Mr. Blake left at his residence near Dorking, and announces his return to England as likely to take place in a week or less. In the meantime, he requests to be favoured with Mr. Blake's reasons for wishing to speak to him, as stated in the message, on the subject of the Moonstone. If Mr. Blake can convict him of having made any serious mistake in the course of his last year's inquiry concerning the diamond, he will consider it a duty, after the liberal manner in which he was treated by the late Lady Verinder, to place himself at that gentleman's disposal. If not, he begs permission to remain in his retirement, surrounded by the peaceful horticultural attractions of a country life. After reading the letter, I had no hesitation in advising Mr. Blake to inform Sergeant Cuff, in reply, of all that had happened since the inquiry was suspended last year, and to leave him to draw his own conclusions from the plain facts. On second thoughts I also suggested inviting the sergeant to be present at the experiment in the event of his returning to England in time to join us. He would be a valuable witness to have in any case, and if I proved to be wrong in believing the diamond to be hidden in Mr. Blake's room, his advice might be of great importance at a future stage of the proceedings over which I could exercise no control. This last consideration appeared to decide Mr. Blake. He promised to follow my advice. The sound of the hammer informed us that the work of refurnishing was in full progress as we entered the drive that led to the house. Betteridge, attired for the occasion in a fisherman's red cap and an apron of green bays, met us in the outer hall. The moment he saw me he pulled out the pocket-book and pencil, and obstinately insisted on taking notes of everything that I said to him. Look where we might, we found, as Mr. Blake had foretold, that the work was advancing as rapidly and as intelligently as it was possible to desire but there was still much to be done in the inner hall and in Miss Verinder's room. It seemed doubtful whether the house would be ready for us before the end of the week. Having congratulated Betteridge on the progress that he had made, he persisted in taking notes every time I opened my lips, declining at the same time to pay the slightest attention to anything said by Mr. Blake, and having promised to return for a second visit of inspection in a day or two, we prepared to leave the house, going out by the back way. Before we were clear of the passages downstairs, I was stopped by Betteridge, just as I was passing the door which led into his own room. "'Could I say two words to you in private?' he asked in a mysterious whisper. I consented, of course. Mr. Blake walked on to wait for me in the garden, while I accompanied Betteridge into his room. I fully anticipated a demand for certain new concessions, following the precedent already established in the cases of the stuffed buzzard and the cupid's wing. To my great surprise, Betteridge laid his hand confidentially on my arm, and put this extraordinary question to me. Mr. Jennings, do you happen to be acquainted with Robinson Crusoe? I answered that I had read Robinson Crusoe when I was a child. Not since then? inquired Betteridge. Not since then. 
He fell back a few steps, and looked at me with an expression of compassionate curiosity, tempered by superstitious awe. "'He has not read Robinson Crusoe since he was a child,' said Betteridge, speaking to himself, not to me. "'Let's try how Robinson Crusoe strikes him now.' He unlocked a cupboard in a corner, and produced a dirty and dog's-eared book, which exhaled a strong odour of stale tobacco as he turned over the leaves. Having found a passage of which he was apparently in search, he requested me to join him in the corner, still mysteriously confidential and still speaking under his breath. "'In respect to this hocus-pocus of yours, sir, with the laudanum and Mr. Franklin Blake,' he began, while the work-people are in the house, my duty as a servant gets the better of my feelings as a man. When the work-people are gone, my feelings as a man get the better of my duty as a servant. Very good. Last night, Mr. Jennings, it was borne in powerfully on my mind that this new medical enterprise of yours would end badly. If I had yielded to that secret dictate— I should have put all the furniture away again with my own hand, and have warned the workmen off the premises when they came the next morning. "'I am glad to find from what I have seen upstairs,' I said, "'that you resisted the secret dictate.' "'Resisted isn't the word,' answered Betteridge. "'Rustled is the word. I rustled, sir, between the silent orders in my bosom pulling me one way, and the written orders in my pocket-book pushing me the other, until, saving your presence, I was in a cold sweat. In that dreadful perturbation of mind and laxity of body, to what remedy did I apply? To the remedy, sir, which has never failed me yet for the last thirty years and more. To this book. He hit the book a sounding blow with his open hand, and struck out of it a stronger smell of stale tobacco than ever. "'What did I find here?' pursued Betteridge. "'At the first page I opened. "'This awful bit, sir, page 178, as follows. "'Upon these and many like reflections I afterwards made it a certain rule with me "'that whenever I found those secret hints or pressings of my mind to doing or not doing any thing that presented, "'or to going this way or that way, I never failed to obey the secret dictate. "'As I live by bread, Mr. Jennings, those were the first words that met my eye, "'exactly at the time when I myself was setting the secret dictate at defiance.' "'You don't see anything at all out of the common in that, do you, sir?' "'I see a coincidence, nothing more.' "'You don't feel at all shaken, Mr. Jennings, in respect to this medical enterprise of yours?' "'Not the least in the world.' Betteridge stared hard at me in dead silence. He closed the book with great deliberation. He locked it up again in the cupboard with extraordinary care— he wheeled round and stared hard at me once more. Then he spoke. "'Sir,' he said gravely, "'there are great allowances to be made for a man who has not read Robinson Crusoe since he was a child. I wish you good morning.' He opened his door with a low bow, and left me at liberty to find my own way into the garden. I met Mr. Blake returning to the house. "'You needn't tell me what has happened,' he said. "'Betteridge has played his last card. "'He has made another prophetic discovery in Robinson Crusoe. "'Have you humoured his favourite delusion? "'No. "'You have let him see that you don't believe in Robinson Crusoe? "'Mr. Jennings, you have fallen to the lowest possible place in Betteridge's estimation. "'Say what you like and do what you like for the future.' "'You will find that he won't waste another word on you now.' "'June the 21st. "'A short entry must suffice in my journal to-day. 
Mr. Blake has had the worst night that he has passed yet. I have been obliged, greatly against my will, to prescribe for him. Men of his sensitive organization are fortunately quick in feeling the effect of remedial measures. Otherwise I should be inclined to fear that he will be totally unfit for the experiment when the time comes to try it. As for myself, after some little remission of my pains for the last two days, I had an attack this morning, of which I shall say nothing but that it has decided me to return to the opium. I shall close this book, and take my full dose, five hundred drops. June the 22nd. Our prospects look better today. Mr. Blake's nervous suffering is greatly allayed. He slept a little last night. My night, thanks to the opium, was the night of a man who is stunned. I can't say that I woke this morning. The fitter expression would be that I recovered my senses. We drove to the house to see if the refurnishing was done. It will be completed tomorrow, Saturday. As Mr. Blake foretold, Betteridge raised no further obstacles. From first to last he was ominously polite and ominously silent. My medical enterprise, as Betteridge calls it, must now inevitably be delayed until Monday next. Tomorrow evening the workmen will be late in the house. On the next day the established Sunday tyranny, which is one of the institutions of this free country, so times the trains as to make it impossible to ask anybody to travel to us from London. Until Monday comes there is nothing to be done but to watch Mr. Blake carefully, and to keep him, if possible, in the same state in which I find him to-day. In the meanwhile I have prevailed on him to write to Mr. Bruff, making a point of it that he shall be present as one of the witnesses. I especially choose the lawyer, because he is strongly prejudiced against us. If we convince him, we place our victory beyond the possibility of dispute. Mr. Blake has also written to Sergeant Cuff, and I have sent a line to Miss Verinder. With these, and with old Betteridge, who is really a person of importance in the family, we shall have witnesses enough for the purpose, without including Mrs. Meridew, if Mrs. Meridew persists in sacrificing herself to the opinion of the world. June the 23rd the vengeance of the opium overtook me again last night. No matter, I must go on with it now till Monday is past and gone. Mr. Blake is not so well again to-day. At two this morning he confesses that he opened the drawer in which his cigars are put away. He only succeeded in locking it up again by a violent effort. His next proceeding, in case of temptation, was to throw the key out of the window. The waiter brought it in this morning, discovered at the bottom of an empty cistern. Such is fate. I have taken possession of the key until Tuesday next. June the 24th. Mr. Blake and I took a long drive in an open carriage. We both felt beneficially the blessed influence of the soft summer air. I dined with him at the hotel. To my great relief, for I found him in an overwrought, overexcited state this morning, he had two hours sound sleep on the sofa after dinner. If he has another bad night now, I am not afraid of the consequence. June the 25th, Monday. The day of the experiment. It is five o'clock in the afternoon. We have just arrived at the house. The first and foremost question is the question of Mr. Blake's health. So far as it is possible for me to judge, he promises, physically speaking, to be quite as susceptible to the action of the opium tonight as he was at this time last year. He is this afternoon in a state of nervous sensitiveness which just stops short of nervous irritation. He changes colour readily, 
his hand is not quite steady, and he starts at chance noises and at unexpected appearances of persons and things. These results have all been produced by deprivation of sleep, which is in its turn the nervous consequence of a sudden cessation in the habit of smoking after that habit has been carried to an extreme. Here are the same causes at work again which operated last year, and here are, apparently, the same effects. Will the parallel still hold good when the final test has been tried? The events of the night must decide. While I write these lines, Mr. Blake is amusing himself at the billiard-table in the inner hall, practising different strokes in the game, as he was accustomed to practise them when he was a guest in this house in June last. I have brought my journal here, partly with a view to occupying the idle hours which I am sure to have on my hands between this and to-morrow morning, partly in the hope that something may happen which it may be worth my while to place on record at the time. Have I omitted anything thus far? A glance at yesterday's entry shows me that I have forgotten to note the arrival of the morning's post. Let me set this right before I close these leaves for the present and join Mr. Blake. I received a few lines then yesterday from Miss Ferrinder. She has arranged to travel by the afternoon train as I recommended. Mrs. Meridew has insisted on accompanying her. The note hints that the old lady's generally excellent temper is a little ruffled, and requests all due indulgence for her in consideration of her age and her habits. I will endeavour, in my relations with Mrs. Meridew, to emulate the moderation which Betteridge displays in his relations with me. He received us to-day portentously arrayed in his best black suit and his stiffest white cravat. Whenever he looks my way, he remembers that I have not read Robinson Crusoe since I was a child, and he respectfully pities me. Yesterday also Mr. Blake had the lawyer's answer. Mr. Bruff accepts the invitation under protest. It is, he thinks, clearly necessary that a gentleman possessed of the average allowance of common sense should accompany Miss Verinder to the scene of what we will venture to call the proposed exhibition. For want of a better escort, Mr. Bruff himself will be that gentleman. So here is poor Miss Verinder provided with two chaperones. It is a relief to think that the opinion of the world must surely be satisfied with this. Nothing has been heard of Sergeant Cuff. He is no doubt still in Ireland. We must not expect to see him to-night. Betteridge has just come in to say that Mr. Blake has asked for me. I must lay down my pen for the present. Seven o'clock. We have been all over the refurnished rooms and staircases again, and we have had a pleasant stroll in the shrubbery, which was Mr. Blake's favourite walk when he was here last. In this way I hope to revive the old impressions of places and things as vividly as possible in his mind. We are now going to dine exactly at the hour at which the birthday dinner was given last year. My object, of course, is a purely medical one in this case. The laudanum must find the process of digestion as nearly as may be where the laudanum found it last year. At a reasonable time after dinner I propose to lead the conversation back again, as inartificially as I can, to the subject of the diamond, and of the Indian conspiracy to steal it. When I have filled his mind with these topics, I shall have done all that it is in my power to do before the time comes for giving him the second dose. Half past eight. I have only this moment found an opportunity of attending to the most important duty of all, the duty of looking in the family medicine chest for the laudanum which Mr. Candy used last year. Ten minutes since I caught Betteridge at an unoccupied moment and told him what I wanted. Without a word of objection, without so much as an attempt to produce his pocket-book, 
He led the way, making allowances for me at every step, to the storeroom in which the medicine chest is kept. I discovered the bottle, carefully guarded by a glass stopper tied over with leather. The preparation which it contained was, as I had anticipated, the common tincture of opium. Finding the bottle still well filled, I have resolved to use it in preference to employing either of the two preparations with which I had taken care to provide myself in case of emergency. The question of the quantity which I am to administer presents certain difficulties. I have thought it over, and have decided on increasing the dose. My notes inform me that Mr. Candy only administered twenty-five minims. This is a small dose to have produced the results which followed, even in the case of a person so sensitive as Mr. Blake. I think it highly probable that Mr. Candy gave more than he supposed himself to have given, knowing, as I do, that he has a keen relish of the pleasures of the table, and that he measured out the laudanum on the birthday after dinner. In any case, I shall run the risk of enlarging the dose to forty minims. On this occasion Mr. Blake knows beforehand that he is going to take the laudanum, which is equivalent, physiologically speaking, to his having, unconsciously to himself, a certain capacity in him to resist the effects. If my view is right, a larger quantity is therefore imperatively required this time to repeat the results which the smaller quantity produced last year. Ten o'clock. The witnesses, or the company, which shall I call them, reached the house an hour since. A little before nine o'clock I prevailed on Mr. Blake to accompany me to his bedroom, stating as a reason that I wished him to look round it for the last time, in order to make quite sure that nothing had been forgotten in the refurnishing of the room. I had previously arranged with Betteridge that the bedchamber prepared for Mr. Bruff should be the next room to Mr. Blake's, and that I should be informed of the lawyer's arrival by a knock at the door. Five minutes after the clock in the hall had struck nine, I heard the knock, and, going out immediately, met Mr. Bruff in the corridor. My personal appearance, as usual, told against me. Mr. Bruff's distrust looked at me plainly enough out of Mr. Bruff's eyes. Being well used to producing this effect on strangers, I did not hesitate a moment in saying what I wanted to say before the lawyer found his way into Mr. Blake's room. "'You have travelled here, I believe, in company with Mrs. Meridew and Miss Verinder,' I said. "'Yes,' answered Mr. Bruff, as dryly as might be. "'Miss Verinder has probably told you that I wish her presence in the house, and Mrs. Meridew's presence, of course, to be kept a secret from Mr. Blake until my experiment on him has been tried first. "'I know that I am to hold my tongue, sir,' said Mr. Bruff impatiently. "'Being habitually silent on the subject of human folly, I am all the readier to keep my lips closed on this occasion. Does that satisfy you?' I bowed, and left Betteridge to show him to his room. Betteridge gave me one look at parting, which said, as if in so many words, "'You have caught a tartar, Mr. Jennings, and the name of him is Bruff.' It was next necessary to get the meeting over with the two ladies. I descended the stairs, a little nervously, I confess, on my way to Miss Verinder's sitting-room. The gardener's wife, charged with looking after the accommodation of the ladies, met me in the first-floor corridor. This excellent woman treats me with an excessive civility which is plainly the offspring of downright terror. She stares, trembles, and curtsies whenever I speak to her. On my asking for Miss Verinder, she stared, trembled, and would no doubt have curtsied next, if Miss Verinder herself had not cut that ceremony short by suddenly opening her sitting-room door. "'Is that Mr. Jennings?' she asked. Before I could answer, she came out eagerly to speak to me in the corridor. We met under the light of a lamp on a bracket. 
At the first sight of me, Miss Verinder stopped and hesitated. She recovered herself instantly, coloured for a moment, and then, with a charming frankness, offered me her hand. "'I can't treat you like a stranger, Mr. Jennings,' she said. "'Oh, if you only knew how happy your letters have made me!' She looked at my ugly, wrinkled face, with a bright gratitude so new to me in my experience of my fellow-creatures, that I was at a loss how to answer her. Nothing had prepared me for her kindness and her beauty. The misery of many years has not hardened my heart, thank God. I was as awkward and as shy with her as if I had been a lad in my teens. "'Where is he now?' she asked, giving free expression to her one dominant interest, the interest in Mr. Blake. "'What is he doing? Has he spoken of me? Is he in good spirits? How does he bear the sight of the house after what happened in it last year? When are you going to give him the laudanum? May I see you pour it out? I am so interested, I am so excited. I have ten thousand things to say to you, and they all crowd together so that I don't know what to say first. Do you wonder at the interest I take in this? No, I said. I venture to think that I thoroughly understand it. She was far above the paltry affectation of being confused. She answered me as she might have answered a brother or a father. You have relieved me of indescribable wretchedness. You have given me a new life. How can I be ungrateful enough to have any concealment from you? I love him, she said simply. I have loved him from first to last, even when I was wronging him in my own thoughts, even when I was saying the hardest and the cruelest words to him. Is there any excuse for me in that? I hope there is. I am afraid it is the only excuse I have. When tomorrow comes, and he knows that I am in the house, do you think— she stopped again and looked at me very earnestly. "'When to-morrow comes,' I said, "'I think you have only to tell him what you have just told me.' Her face brightened. She came a step nearer to me. Her fingers trifled nervously with a flower which I had picked in the garden and which I had put into the buttonhole of my coat. "'You have seen a great deal of him lately,' she said. Have you really and truly seen that? Really and truly, I answered. I am quite certain of what will happen tomorrow. I wish I could feel as certain of what will happen tonight. At that point in the conversation we were interrupted by the appearance of Betteridge with the tea tray. He gave me another significant look as he passed on into the sitting room, "'Aye, aye, make your hay while the sun shines. "'The Tartar's upstairs, Mr. Jennings, the Tartar's upstairs.' "'We followed him into the room. "'A little old lady in a corner, very nicely dressed, "'and very deeply absorbed over a smart piece of embroidery, "'dropped her work in her lap, "'and uttered a faint little scream at the first sight "'of my gypsy complexion and my piebald hair.' "'Mrs. Meridew,' said Miss Verinder, "'this is Mr. Jennings.' "'I beg Mr. Jennings's pardon,' said the old lady, looking at Miss Verinder and speaking at me. "'Railway travelling always makes me nervous. I am endeavouring to quiet my mind by occupying myself as usual. I don't know whether my embroidery is out of place on this extraordinary occasion.' If it interferes with Mr. Jennings's medical views, I shall be happy to put it away, of course. I hastened to sanction the presence of the embroidery, exactly as I had sanctioned the absence of the burst buzzard and the cupid's wing. Mrs. Meridew made an effort, a grateful effort, to look at my hair. No, it was not to be done. Mrs. Meridew looked back again at Miss Verinder. 
"'If Mr. Jennings will permit me,' pursued the old lady, "'I should like to ask a favour. "'Mr. Jennings is about to try a scientific experiment tonight. "'I used to attend scientific experiments when I was a girl at school. "'They invariably ended in an explosion. "'If Mr. Jennings will be so very kind, "'I should like to be warned of the explosion this time.' with a view to getting it over, if possible, before I go to bed. I attempted to assure Mrs. Merridew that an explosion was not included in the programme on this occasion. No, said the old lady, I am much obliged to Mr. Jennings. I am aware that he is only deceiving me for my own good. I prefer plain dealing. I am quite resigned to the explosion— "'But I do want to get it over, if possible, before I go to bed.' Here the door opened, and Mrs. Merridew uttered another little scream. The advent of the explosion? No, only the advent of Betteridge. "'I beg your pardon, Mr. Jennings,' said Betteridge, in his most elaborately confidential manner. "'Mr. Franklin wishes to know where you are.' "'Being under your orders to deceive him in respect to the presence of my young lady in the house, "'I have said I don't know. "'That, you will please to observe, was a lie. "'Having one foot already in the grave, sir, "'the fewer lies you expect me to tell, the more I shall be indebted to you, "'when my conscience pricks me and my time comes.' "'There was not a moment to be wasted on the purely speculative question of Betteridge's conscience.' Mr. Blake might make his appearance in search of me, unless I went to him at once in his own room. Miss Verinder followed me out into the corridor. "'They seem to be in a conspiracy to persecute you,' she said. "'What does it mean?' "'Only the protest of the world, Miss Verinder, on a very small scale, against anything that is new. What are we to do with Mrs. Merridew?' "'Tell her the explosion will take place at nine to-morrow morning. "'So as to send her to bed? "'Yes, so as to send her to bed. "'Miss Verinda went back to the sitting-room, "'and I went upstairs to Mr. Blake. "'To my surprise, I found him alone, "'restlessly pacing his room, "'and a little irritated at being left by himself. "'Where is Mr. Bruff?' I asked. He pointed to the closed door of communication between the two rooms. Mr. Bruff had looked in on him for a moment, had attempted to renew his protest against our proceedings, and had once more failed to produce the smallest impression on Mr. Blake. Upon this the lawyer had taken refuge in a black leather bag, filled to bursting with professional papers. "'The serious business of life,' he admitted, "'was sadly out of place on such an occasion as the present. "'But the serious business of life must be carried on for all that. "'Mr. Blake would perhaps kindly make allowance "'for the old-fashioned habits of a practical man. "'Time was money, and, as for Mr. Jennings, "'he might depend on it that Mr. Bruff would be forthcoming when called upon.' With that apology the lawyer had gone back to his own room, and had immersed himself obstinately in his black bag. I thought of Mrs. Merridew and her embroidery, and of Betteridge and his conscience. There is a wonderful sameness in the solid side of the English character, just as there is a wonderful sameness in the solid expression of the English face. "'When are you going to give me the laudanum?' "'asked Mr. Blake impatiently. "'You must wait a little longer,' I said. "'I will stay and keep you company till the time comes.' "'It was then not ten o'clock. "'Inquiries which I had made at various times, "'of Betteridge and Mr. Blake, "'had led me to the conclusion "'that the dose of laudanum given by Mr. Candy "'could not possibly have been administered before eleven. I had accordingly determined not to try the second dose until that time. We talked a little, 
but both our minds were preoccupied by the coming ordeal. The conversation soon flagged, then dropped altogether. Mr. Blake idly turned over the books on his bedroom table. I had taken the precaution of looking at them when we first entered the room. The Guardian, the Tatler, Richardson's Pamela, Mackenzie's Man of Feeling, Roscoe's Lorenzo de' Medici, and Robertson's Charles V, all classical works, all, of course, immeasurably superior to anything produced in later times, and all, from my present point of view, possessing the one great merit of enchaining nobody's interest and exciting nobody's brain. I left Mr. Blake to the composing influence of standard literature, and occupied myself in making this entry in my journal. My watch informs me that it is close on eleven o'clock. I must shut up these leaves once more. End of part forty-three